Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the APSC JCS 2020 session. The title is New Technique in PCI. And today uh, we have four speakers and uh, uh, we want to have a great talk. And I am the uh, chairperson, Dr. Ikari from Tokyo University, Japan. And co-chair is Dr. Tam. Dr. Tam? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. So uh, do, do, uh, can you make some comments in the first study? Oh, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this APSC uh, GSC meeting, even though we can't uh, meet up face to face, but this is great. I'm actually looking very much forward to this, uh, this program that is uh, being planned. Okay, thank you. So uh, we want to move to the uh, speakers. So Dr. Tang, uh, can you introduce the first speaker, Dr. Michael Lee? Hi, Michael. Uh, I have known Michael for many years. So uh, Hi, he's the president elect of uh, APSIT, and he's also the uh, head of uh, cardiology in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. And Michael Lee is a well known uh, uh, structural as well as coronary uh, interventionist. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about the treatment of calcified lesions using shockwave road later as well as a CSI diamond bike, I suppose, and how to choose uh, among these devices. So Michael Lee, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to talk on this. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, topic. Uh, when we are facing with calcified lesions, we uh, have to use some sort of devices to help us to uh, finish the uh, intervention procedures and obtain an optimal result. So today I'm going to talk on the three devices, the rotor blader, the optical arthrectomy device, as well as the shortwave balloon, and then try to summarize how we are going to choose among the three of them. Um, uh, we all know from uh, a lot of clinical trials, this is one of the uh, meta-analysis of 70 years trials, and also uh, in a lot of the ACS trials, that whenever you see calcium, you will have worse outcomes. And actually, uh, the severity of calcium also predict a uh, worst outcome as compared to a lesion or a coronary artery without calcium. It, uh, the, the bad outcomes are uh, in terms of the death, MI, or any revascularization. So when we are facing with calcified vessels, we aim at optimally uh, treat, uh, treated uh, results and then to have a better outcome uh, for our patients in the future. That's why we use a lot of imaging in our uh, um, uh, interventions involving calcified lesions. You will hear this uh, later on in the other talks, but uh, we use a lot of OCT uh, and uh, uh, during the uh, OCT runs or OFDI runs, we will look at the calcium in terms of the angle, the art of the calcium, the thickness, as well as the length of the calcium. So we sort of uh, call it a five, five, five rule. Like if uh, it involves more than 50% of the art, more than 180 degrees, then we will have points. And if we, uh, the thickness is more than 0.5 millimeter or the calcium length is more than five millimeters, then it all adds up points to uh, if um, uh, the lesion has a very high point, then you will see that it actually predicts a worse outcome because the stain is not going to be expanded adequately enough to give the patient a, a good outcome uh, in the future. So that's why we are very much uh, 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 inclined to use this sort of scoring system to guide our interventions and how good uh, we should treat the calcified lesions before we put in stents. There are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, devices to treat this uh, calcium. You will hear more about the uh, cutting balloons, scoring balloons from Dr. Yin later on. Uh, on the other hand, we also got a, a lot of devices for this um, uh, calcified lesions. I'm not going to talk too much on the laser uh, therapy because we don't have laser in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the rotor, uh, rotational arthrectomy 
orbital arthrectomy as well as the short wave lipotripsy balloon. Uh, Volta Blater has been with us uh, for a, quite a, uh, some time. Uh, it's actually approved in uh, 1993, a long time ago. Uh, it actually involves a lot of diamond chip at the tip of the burr. We call this a burr. And with a very high speed rotation, then the uh, diamond chips will actually make a path uh, out of the cal very calcified lesions and to enable us to uh, actually modify the calcium and then facilitate our future uh, uh, interventional procedures. With the evolving of the rotor blader, now we are using the rotor pro system in which we don't need to use the footstep anymore. Uh, it's sort of like uh, um, the uh, old design of the rotor blader uh, uh, handle, but you can actually uh, uh, activate the activate uh, the, the rotor blader or do a dyna glide run only by pushing the buttons. Um, there are a lot of evidence uh, for the rotor blader system, mainly in terms of modification of the calcium. So if you look at the uh, one of these uh, trials, the Road Texas uh, trial, which was presented a long time ago, 2013, and in this particular uh, study. If you look at the details, actually rotor blader enhanced uh, a lot more uh, stra strategy success as compared when you just use PTCA. And the crossover rate from PTCA to rotor plus uh, 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 Texas stand is actually higher when we are not planning to use rotor blader uh, in the very first beginning. So it actually facilitate us to um, finish our procedure uh, uh, much more efficient when we use motor blader. And if we look at the nine month follow up, clinically, you don't see a lot of difference when you are using a uh, motor blader or just simple balloon together with stenting. So, no difference. But um, uh, so, although this uh, motor blader did not really improve the DES efficacy, but it still remains an important tool for especially the uncrossable lesions or undilatable lesions improve the overall procedural success in this particular setting. And um, we learned from our Japanese colleagues that if we uh, lower the speed of the rotor ablation uh, to uh, about uh, uh, 100,000 uh, uh, RPM, then you can actually uh, uh, get a more um, uh, 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 ablation of the calcium so that you will handle a, a slightly bigger vessel. Because uh, the drawback for rotor blader is that it only uh, allows you to uh, ablate the um, uh, amount of calcium along the uh, uh, vessel as determined by the birth size. So uh, we, we see a lot of um, uh, complications uh, with rotor ablation, especially for the beginners. Uh, we see stuck burrs and we see this uh, is one of the complications that uh, when we uh, encounter some sort of tortuous uh, uh, angulated vessels, it might sometimes end up in uh, perforation of the vessels, especially when you are add on the uh, NC balloons after rotor ablation. So um, there are some certain uh, technical um, uh, uh, um, techniques that you have to remember when using this uh, rotor ablation system. Uh, but the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, this orbital arthrectomy system is a sort of a newer system, which also use a, a, a sort of a burr, but they call it a sort of a, a, a crown. There are, uh, again, diamond chips are loaded on this sort of crown, and you actually use uh, a centrifugal force, as uh, seen in this uh, diagram, uh, to actually ablate the superficial calcium, and sometimes you will ablate the deep calcium uh, as well. Uh, you can have a normal speed or you have, have high speed, try to ablate more of the calcium in uh, a bigger vessel. So unlike motor ablation, the orbital arthrectomy is not limited by the size of the burr. Actually, you can uh, ablate calcium for a big vessel up to four 
uh, millimeter in diameter by this centrifugal force. Um, if we look at the uh, clinical trials, the orbit 2 trial actually show that uh, it is actually quite a safe device to use without much complications. And then it actually will enable successful stand delivery in almost uh, a majority of the uh, patients, majority of the cases. So very, very effective in modifying the calcium and then allow the um, procedure to be finished. Um, this was actually echoed by another COAST uh, trial. You look at the efficacy endpoint, a very, very uh, uh, much like the orbit 2 trial, uh, enable more than 80% procedure success, even in the most uh, calcified vessels, again, without much, uh, many um, more increase in the complications. Of course, uh, the Eclipse trial is still ongoing. This is probably the biggest arthrect uh, orbital arthrectomy trials involving uh, about 2,000 patients, one-to-one -one randomization to either orbital arthrectomy or conventional angioplasty, followed by the usual uh, imaging uh, techniques and then um, stenting procedures and then followed by post-imaging OCT. So we are waiting for the results of this trial, but I'm sure this will give a lot more uh, uh, shed a lot more light uh, to this uh, orbital arthrectomy devices. So I've mentioned uh, the, the two approaches uh, 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 have a slightly different mechanism. For the blood, blood ablation, it depends very much on the burr to make a track. So it's sort of uh, very limited by the size of the burr. Uh, it is sort of unidirectional uh, you can only go for it when you're played and then you have to pull it back and then do another run of uh, wood ablation. And the arthrectomy, orbital arthrectomy is a little bit different. It sort of use um, centrifugal force and you can apply the um, calcium both when you go for it as well as when you pull the device back uh, to modify the calcium. So it can actually uh, be useful for even a very big vessel and sometimes you can actually ablate deeper calcium. Shortwave uh, lipotripsy is a totally different concept. This uh, device actually uses uh, uh, electrical energy to generate sort of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, expanding and collapsing vapor bubbles inside the balloon uh, uh, with the uh, contrast saline medium and it will generate sort of sonic pressure. And this sonic pressure will travel along the vessel tissue and uh, deliver a very high equivalent pressure. The effective pressure is, uh, can be reached as high as 50 atmosphere. And it sort of has a very localized effect. It will not uh, fracture the normal vessel tissue, but it can fracture both the intima and the medial uh, calcium. So even a deep calcium, you can create a fissure fracture of the calcium. Um, as I mentioned, this is the uh, change from electrical energy to this sort of uh, sonic pressure waveform, which will travel along the vessel to crack the calcium very safely. And these are the um, typical uh, OCT findings after the, uh, uh, after the shortwave uh, lipotripsy. You can see this deep calcium, both in the superficial and the deep uh, calcium. A very, very effective fracturing of the calcium. Um, the, um, uh, the concept has actually been supported uh, by the Disrupt Cat 1 and Disrupt uh, Cat 2 trials uh, and then uh, there are ongoing trials with disrupt uh, cat 3 as well as cat 4 in the uh, Japan market. What they uh, have uh, found is that uh, shortwave lipotripsy is highly effective in uh, calcified uh, vessels. Uh, it enables a 100% stand deployment with a very good uh, acute gain and low rate of reduced stenosis. It is very safe to use. They don't uh, observe any major intra-procedural complications, uh, no perforation, no embolization, no slow flow. So very, very safe device to use. And uh, we follow this um, 
uh, algorithm very much um, uh, like uh, if uh, we cannot cross with the balloon, this is uncrossable, we would uh, use motor ablation or, or orbital arthrectomy sometimes uh, to uh, give us a track. If we can cross the lesion, very high uh, calcium score, then we will probably start with the lipotripsy and then uh, use imaging to guide us finish the procedure. We have the honor to do the first uh, shortwave uh, case uh, outside US in this Asia Pacific region uh, uh, back in May, 2019. Uh, I'll quickly show you uh, two cases which we actually use combination uh, uh, therapies. This is a sort of a total occlusion of the distal uh, LAD lesion. Uh, after we pass with the uh, guide wire, it's very, very tight stenosis. So we use a uh, uh, rotor ablation to, first of all, create a track for us to pass any uh, balloon down. And then we use a shortwave balloon, both a 2.5 and then 3.0 to uh, uh, crack the calcium. And then if we look at the uh, OCT images, you see this very, very deep cracking of the calcium, fracturing of the calcium. And then uh, after stenting, you see this uh, adequately uh, expand the stand with good position at the end of our procedure. Uh, another case is an RCA case. Uh, it's not really particularly uh, severe stenotic, but it's a big vessel, big RCA, uh, and with a very thick calcium, 1.8 millimeter. Uh, so we started with uh, orbital arthrectomy at low speed uh, distally and then high speed uh, proximally. And then uh, you see this uh, OA, uh, OAS orbital arthrectomy OCT run uh, after our uh, orbital arthrectomy. And uh, usually you will see this, what we call the snowman sign because the wire fires to one side so that the orbital arthrectomy will create a more effective uh, ablation uh, along the uh, guide wire side. And then we use a 3.0 and 3.5 short wave to further crack the calcium. And you see this uh, cracking, fracturing of the calcium after the short wave balloon. And then uh, stenting, uh, very effective, a very good result achieved at the end of our procedure. So if you ask me how to choose the three devices, I would say uh, this is a table I made for myself and for our team. When we encounter severe stenosis, CTO, long diffuse, small vessel, we tend to use a, a lot more uh, rotor ablation. When the vessel is a big vessel, diffuse, uh, when we want to treat the uh, superficial calcium as well as the deep calcium, especially when it is eccentric or calcium nodules, we tend to use more of the orbital arthrectomy. Uh, otherwise, for uh, we want to crack both the superficial and deep calcium or for some osteo lesions, we tend to use more of this shortwave balloon. So in summary, I think calcium is one of the worst enemies in our interventional procedures nowadays. And we need to do some modification of the calcium to more optimize our stenting result. We have both the rotor ablation of arthrectomy, orbital arthrectomy and shortwave lipotripsy available. And uh, it is very essential when we encounter these sort of lesions we use intracoronary imaging to guide us how to choose the different uh, arthrectomy devices. And we should have a very low threshold for combination arthrectomy. We use rotor shock and also orbital shock very often. And even the, for the peripherals, we really use uh, two cases for shock the peripheral uh, arteries, eyelid arteries for us to finish the TAFI procedure. And in the future, I'm sure there will be short wave available for modification of the calcified aortic valve in the setting of aortic stenosis as well. Uh, this is our uh, complication and the cheap meeting in Hong Kong in November. It's a virtual meeting. You are welcome to join us in November. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the comprehensive coverage of the latest uh, devices for the treatment of calcified lesions. Uh, now, because uh, we have uh, far exceeded the time uh, for discussion, Stephen, uh, I would... Uh, perhaps uh, ask you to stay back because we do have a okay. sessions, uh, a discussion sessions right at the end of this uh, symposium. So perhaps you can sure. stay on and help you answer some of the questions that has been yes, raised by sure, the participants. No so I'd like to invite the Kari now to introduce the next speaker. Yes, please. The next speaker is Dr. Yin. Please introduce Dr. Yin.
Tak, me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Ikari to introduce Dr. Ah, Ying Weijian. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry about that. Yeah, next speaker is Dr. Ying, the um, Heart Center Chen General Hospital, Taiwan. And he will talk about the cutting balloon and just scalp, scoff legs, OPN, and the other specialty balloons. So, Dr. Ying, please. Hi, everybody. It's my great pleasure and honor to share with you my some experience regarding the cutting balloon, uh, scoring balloon, and other special balloons. Uh, as we know, conventional PCI using uh, plant uh, or balloon angioplasty as a standalone uh, strategy. During that time, we only have semi compliant balloon, which have uh, better flexibility and trackability. However, uh, it cannot delay a uh, to calcific or fibrotic lesion. So later on, we have a non-compliant balloon uh, designed for dilatation of cal calcified or resistant uh, lesions. However, uh, we do have some complex lesions that uh, needed uh, higher or super high pressure dilatation, uh, such as uh, those with uh, highly calcified lesions and dilatable lesions or successful uh, treatment for the instant restenosis and uh, uh, during the age of uh, BBAs, we, we may need to prepare the lesion even better. So uh, we can uh, use uh, even uh, higher pressure balloon, ultra high pressure balloon, such as uh, the, the OPN, although it's uh, not available in Taiwan, but uh, according to the introduction of the device. Uh, there are two layers of a uh, balloon construction with a virtual zero duck bone uh, effect. So it's really uh, uh, attractive. Uh, with this uh, balloon, the RBP will be as high as uh, 35 uh, ATM, and it is uh, least compliant on the market. Uh, according to the reports, uh, it can be very effective in the treatment of a heavily calcified lesion or instant restenosis with uh, acceptable and uh, I would say very good outcome in this uh, particular uh, populations. However, in dealing with the heavily calcified lesion, uh, we have to keep in mind that if we use a too aggressive uh, baloney only, uh, for the heavy calcified lesion, although rare, but it do uh, it does it does will uh, will cause some com complications such as uh, uh, vessel rupture. So uh, to me, uh, for those uh, with uh, uh, type two uh, type B two or uh, mild uh, C lesion, I would rather to use the scoring balloon. There are two mo um, most uh, popular uh, scoring balloons uh, on the market. Uh, one is angel scalp. Uh, the angel scalp balloon consists of a double lumen caster with a semi compliant balloon surrounded by a uh, 19 base uh, helical uh, scoring edge. Uh, this uh, balloon is designed to be more flexible and more deliverable versus a uh, cutting balloon across complex station. Uh, the expansion poverty of the uh, spiral strut uh, can, can have a very good uh, uh, expansion uh, during the balloon inflation. So in type two, uh, B2 and uh, mild type, type C lesion, you can accomplish a very satisfactory result. However, uh, there are some uh, complications uh, with the use of this kind of balloon such as balloon trapping during uh, dilatation uh, of a uh, heavy calcified lesion. The nitinol uh, guide wire uh, surrounding the balloon may get caught on the calcium specular when, when, when you uh, want to withdraw it. So uh, personally, I would rather to use the so-called focused force uh, angioplasty with a uh, scoflex uh, balloon in the uh, less calcific uh, lesion, but uh, uh, but do have some calcification or resistant uh, fibrotic lesion. Uh, this balloon has the benefit uh, advantage of a uh, uh, very low po uh, crossing profile and uh, ch good trackability. So you just have to use a uh, low dilatation pressure and uh, can effective uh, uh, dilate the vessel. Uh, 
the 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 balloon had two wires. Uh, one is uh, the integral wire, 19 o, and uh, the other is the guide wire, conventional guide wire. In this way, it can uh, score the lesion uh, with uh, for, force focus uh, angioplasty. Uh, this, in this way, it can cre uh, create a focal stress that make a higher pre uh, pressure on a local localized lesion of the prep. However, we do have some uh, more heavily calcified lesion that uh, needing more aggressive cutting. In, uh, we all know the cutting balloon. The cutting balloon is a special balloon with uh, three or four astrotomes uh, bound longitudinal to its uh, surface. Uh, it can uh, create discrete longitudinal incision on, on the astroma plaque, uh, the so-called astrotomy. So when the cutting balloon is inflated, the tiny astrotomes score the arterial wall and interrupting the elastic and fibrotic tissue and allowing a break uh, to displace during stenting or balloon, uh, further balloon dilatation. And with a cutting balloon increase in the uh, vessel lumen is obtained in a more controlled fashion. That means uh, you, if you appropriate the sizing, uh, the vessel and the choose the appropriate uh, cutting balloon, you won't uh, rupture the vessel, uh, but you can cut the lesion in a very satisfactory or effective way. Furthermore, in some instant restenotic lesion, it's really slippery. Uh, with the use of a cutting balloon, it can have some anchoring uh, 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 effect on the lesion and uh, stay there and uh, make a good balloon dilatation. Also, if you have a, a conventional balloon uh, or stenting may cause a plaque shift. Uh, with the use of cutting balloon, you can avoid uh, uh, plaque shift too, uh, too, too much. So this can also uh, preserve the lesion patency after the stenting. Uh, we also have newer generation cutting balloon in Taiwan now. We love it. And as you can see, because the height of the, uh, the astrotome was uh, less than that of the, that of the, the flextome, the uh, last, last generation devices, it can improve the crossability and the developability. And uh, you can make a very controlled cutting uh, during the balloon inflation. So uh, with the use of a cutting balloon, you can treat instantotic, uh, instant restenotic lesion. You can treat small vessel uh, under a very optimal proper, uh, uh, or proper sizing to reduce the plaque shift as we shown. And uh, you can treat resistant uh, uh, lesions or even you can do some uh, cutting ballooning after rot abrasion to prepare the lesion. Uh, usually, I follow the rule that mentioned uh, by Michael previously in previous presentation. If the thickness of the uh, calcium was less than uh, five, five, 500, uh, I will use uh, cutting. I will show you a case. This is an 85-year-old uh, gentleman present uh, with unstable in general and heart failure. As you can see, there is a left main distal lesion and also a long RCA lesion. Both calcific. When we did the uh, IVAS, we can see the calcium about uh, 180 degree, and uh, the circa a circumference of free of disease at the ostium. Although uh, at the portion, middle portion is uh, diseased, but the vessel was uh, small in size, so we decided to use just cut cutting balloon and then stenting. So as you can see, we can do the procedure very easily after uh, uh, understand the lesion and the pot, make pot. Although there is some edge dissection, we can put the second stand and uh, result in the very good final result. And for the RCA, we also use the IVAS uh, guidance. As you can see, although the, the vessel was diseased and there was uh, calcium, but the calcium is not that thick. And actually, it's a, there are some 
some area that can be break. So in this kind of uh, lesion, we usually chose uh, cutting We use uh, 275 and then 30 cutting ballon. And as you can see, the even the, the superficial calcium can be break very effectively by the by the cutting ballon. So after that, we can stain the vessel and get a very satisfactory result. However, we do have some uh, diffuse and heavily calcified lesion that uh, needing needing rot abrasion before uh, stenting. In this uh, very large vessel, we start from the small liver and upsize to two zero. And even after that, we can use a cutting balloon to pave the way and make some cutting uh, incision on the astroma. And then use a non-compliant balloon and then with the existence of an extension caster, we can stain the vessel and post dye the vessel and get, very, uh, get a very satisfactory result. I think there are many other balloons that can have other potentials in the treatment of coronary disease, such as the drug coding balloon, which is uh, well accepted and uh, very popular ones. And as uh, Michael showed us, uh, I think in the future, we are eager to use a shockwave balloon, not only in the coronary uh, field, but also the peripheral and the, the structure higher uh, scenario. So uh, in summary, I would say, while st stain implantation undoubtedly the mainstay of the current uh, PCI, however, certain, certain type of uh, lesions remain a challenge for optimizing vessel patency, even in the modern stain area. There are significant uh, heterogeneity in practice and the controversy regarding the best approach for some some kind of uh, complex lesion involving coronary ostia, uh, bifurcation, heavy cash five ones, and the CTO. So even when stand implant, uh, implantation is planned, there are many potential strategies for lesion preparation, including direct stenting, high pressure balloning, uh, astro, uh, astro abrasion uh, with the use of uh, road abrasion, simul laser, or astrectomy and uh, scoring balloon uh, or cutting balloon. So I think in the future, we are eager to see there are more and more coin balloons that have other potential application in the treatment of complex de novo or restenol issue. I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned about the cutting balloon and other uh, devices and a uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, we have a few minutes. So do you have comments from the uh, panels? So Dr. Ying, how are you? Uh, yes, watching yes. Here? Hi, Hi, yeah. Hi, so when you use cutting balloon for calcified lesions, do you go on very high pressure or you uh, use the uh, normal pressure, you know, for? You, you mean the cutting balloon? Yeah, if you are using it, is there a difference in the pressure that you will use for cutting balloon in treating a calcified versus a non-calcified lesion? For non-calcified lesion, I will use uh, a regular uh, the pressure. But for calcified lesion, I use a high pressure, maybe up to 16 or 18. I think the, the beauty of the cutting balloon is that it can create don't longitudinal cutting in the control fashion. I think that's that's very good, very effective. Hmm. And have you experienced the burst using the high pressure? Mm, up to now, no. <laughs> no, yeah. No, no, up to now. Uh, Actually, I think yeah, that... we use very high pressure, but uh, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cannot. Oh, uh, hi. Did you? Everyone, use... but. Uh, in some cases, it's very effective. Yeah. Only so if the calcium is uh, superficial in location, I think uh, cutting balloon is good. 
But uh, in those with uh, ring calcification with a uh, thickness of uh, more than 500, I would strongly recommend just go for the, the road operation or, or other devices. Hmm. How high a pressure have you ever gone up to using an NC balloon for calcified issue? NC balloon? Yeah. In my lab, 29 or 30 with wow. the regular ones. But usually you will burst. <laughs> <laughs> no, balloon burst or the lesion uh, overcome? But the balloon burst is not an issue, you know. Usually we use uh, a, a bit undersized. It is because uh, you are using undersized balloon that, that you, are de you dare to, to inflate in such high pressure. And sometimes the burst, we, we call it the burst balloon technique can create some kind of, uh, you know, lesions or injury to the intima. Then mm -hmm. you, can, you can do further procedure, especially in the CTO lesion, you can use a smaller balloon uh, to do balloon burst on purpose. Then you can pave the way and uh, do the following procedures. Mm. Balloon okay. burst is another PCI technique. <laughs> yeah. But it's not easy to burst a non-compliant balloon, you know. Not that easy. Usually, it's uh, in the in the in the heavily calcified dish with some you know uh, calcific nodules or, or uh, specula, and then it, it penetrate the, 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 the balloon surface and then burst the balloon. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, think, yeah. Thank you very much. So thank we you. want to move to the next speaker. So uh, I introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Otake from Kobe University. And uh, his talk is about the OCT and IRIS. So Dr. Otake, please. So thank you, Dr. Ikari, for your kind introduction. I'm Hiromasa Otake, um, Kobe University Hospital. So in the next 12 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, similarities and differences between OCT guided PCI and IBUS guided PCI in the LR of DES. So this is my COI. In the LR of bare metal stands, there have been many studies evaluating the impact of IBUS guided PCI by comparing angio guided PCI. So as shown in this figure, most of such studies uh, showed a significant improvement in the clinical outcomes as compared with uh, angio-guided PCI based upon relatively uh, small numbers of patients like uh, uh, several hundreds of patients listed over here. On the other hand, for more than 10 years after DES became clinically available, there had been no studies showing the benefit or utility of IVAS guided PCI as compared with IVAS guided PCI. However, in the mid 12, mid uh, 2010s, two randomized studies clearly demonstrated a significant improvement in the clinical outcomes after drug editing stent implantation by using IVAS guided PCI as compared with angio guided PCI. These studies required more than 1,000 patients to show the clinical benefit of intravascular ultrasound guided PCI. Interestingly, even in this IBUS guided uh, PCI arms in both studies, um, cases with successful stand optimization were able to show a significant improvement in the clinical outcomes why there was no statistical improvement was observed in the cases which failed to uh, stand optimization. Therefore, I think uh, the important message of these studies are that uh, it's not just important to use IVUS, but IVUS guided stand optimization is important. Regarding the comparisons between uh, IVUS guided PCI versus OCT guided PCI, today's topics. Uh, recently, we conducted the opinion study, which is a prospective multi-center randomized non-inferiority trial 
comparing OFDI guided PCI versus IVUS guided PCI. Uh, the primary endpoint of this study was target vessel failure at 12 months after PCI, and a total of 800 patients were randomly uh, assigned either to receive OFDI guided PCI or IVUS guided PCI, and clinically followed up for a duration of 12 months after the uh, PCI. And for most of the cases, we used uh, bio limus eruting second generation drug eruting stents. So, looking at baseline patient characteristics, most of the parameters were nicely balanced between the groups, and the mean age was about 70, and uh, about 90% of uh, study patients were stable angina patients. So looking at procedural characteristics, uh, most of the procedural information uh, characteristics didn't differ between the groups. However, uh, stent diameter used in the OFDI guided PCI arm were slightly but significantly smaller than uh, cases in the IVAS guided PCI group which is probably because um, OFDI guided stent sizing is based upon lumen size, but IVAS guided stent sizing is based upon the uh, vessel size. However, these slight um, differences in stent size selection was not translated into uh, clinical outcomes. Looking at this figure, you can realize that uh, the OFDI guided PCI arm showed a long inferiority in terms of the uh, target vessel failure 12 months after implantation as compared with IVAS guided PCI arm. Also, in this opinion study, we also had an imaging sub study enrolling the initial 100 consecutive patients out of um, patients enrolled in the opinion main trial. In this trial as well, we uh, randomly assigned patients into OFDI guided PCI arm and IVAS guided PCI arm one by one. And for all the patients, we performed um, post PCI IVAS and uh, OFDI for both arms. Also followed up by uh, eight months follow-up coronary angiography with uh, OFDI. So for even in patients randomized in the IVAS guided PCI arm, uh, those patients also performed uh, or performed OFDI immediately after PCI. So let's look at the angiographic characteristics. Uh, as you can see here, all the parameters were nicely balanced and uh, sorry, a reference vessel diameter was quite comparable uh, between the groups, which is uh, 2.6 millimeter in uh, diameter. Lesion length was 18.2 for OFDI guided arm and 20.3 IVAS guided PCI arm. Diameter stenosis was not statistically different. Also in the study, 80% um, of uh, lesions were treated with uh, bio limiting stents. However, like uh, as a result from opinion main study, uh, OFDI guided arm selected uh, slightly but significantly smaller stent diameter as compared with IVAS guided PCI arm. So let's move on to the post PCI OFDI results. Regarding stent expansion, Minimum stent area and mean stent area tended to be smaller in the OFDI guided PCI group than in the IVAS guided PCI group, which is a blue one. And these results were followed um, because of the uh, difference in the stent size selection between OCT guided and uh, IVAS guided PCI arm. So regarding stent molar position immediately after stenting, uh, the frequency of molar pose struts in the molar pose volume were uh, numerically fewer and smaller in the OFDI guided to PCI arm, although they didn't reach a statistical significance like this. 
looking at tissue protrusion, the overall incidence and the numbers were not statistically different between the groups. Yeah. However, when we classified all the protrusion into smooth, disrupted, and irregular protrusion, the incidence of irregular protrusion was significantly fewer uh, in the OFDI guided PCI arm as compared with uh, IVAS guided PCI arm. Right now, irregular protrusion is considered to reflect um, moderate to severe vessel injury due to stenting with slumbers or lipid component um, protruding into the lumen. A previous study by Soe et al. showed uh, that uh, the presence of irregular protrusion had a comparable impact on target lesion revascularization after stenting, which is one of the strongest uh, predictors for target lesion revascularization after stenting, as you may all know. Therefore, the uh, lower incidence of irregular protrusion observed in the OFDI-guided OFDI -guided PCI arm might be a positive aspect of this approach. So when you look at the incidence of stent edge dissection and uh, stent edge dissection with hematoma, the overall incidence of stent edge dissection was quite similar. Uh, between the groups for proximal reference and distal reference. However, stand edge dissection with hematoma uh, was only uh, observed in the IVAS guided PCI group, whereas no such cases was observed in the OFDI guided PCI group. So let's move on to the eight months follow up OFDI results. Regarding neurointimal proliferation, the mean neurointimal thickness and the area were uh, tended to be thinner and smaller in the OFDI guided PCI group as compared with IVAS guided PCI group, which is probably because the larger standard expansion based upon IVAS guidance may uh, exaggerate the neurointimal proliferation uh, than you know, OFDI guided uh, stenting. As a result, although minimum stent area at post PCI tended to smaller in OFDI guided to PCI group, minimum lumen area and the mean lumen area were comparable in both groups eight months after uh, stent implantation. On the other hand, the percentage of uncoupled struts were significantly uh, larger in the OFDI guided group as compared with IVAS guided PCI group, which is uh, probably reflecting the more, you know, narrow intimal coverage observed in the IVAS guided PCI group. So this is a summary slide uh, from opinion imaging trial. So overall target vessel failure was uh, quite comparable between the groups and the stent sizing and the minimum stent area post PCI was larger for IVAS guided PCI arm. On the other hand, the irregular protrusion and the dissection with hematoma was uh, fewer in the OFDI guided PCI arm. Minimum lumen area at eight months quite equal. And uh, neurointimal growth was slightly OFDI better and the incidence of uncovered struts was IVAS better. So there are some similarities and uh, differences between uh, the two guidance. So this is my uh, summary and the conclusion slide. So intravascular imaging guided PCI is superior to angio guided PCI. OCT guided PCI is non-inferior to IBAS guided PCI in terms of clinical outcomes as shown in the opinion main trial. But each modality probably have, um, may have slight differences in the local standard segment. I think the argument is not IVAS versus OCT, but we need to understand potential features obtained from each guidance and differently used as the situation demands. Thank you very much for your kind uh, attention. Yeah, thank you very much.
a uh, very nice presentation between OCP and IVERS. And uh, uh, it's, it's a great, great question, which, which is better to use in the <laughs> PCI. And um, your data showed the uh, IVERS uh, stent size is a little larger and OCP or OFDI is a little bit smaller and everything is comes from the uh, that dif difference, I think. Uh, it, it, it is okay? Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. And of course, the, you know, I was guided the PCI, we usually refer to um, EEM, I mean, vessel size, and the uh, OCT guided PCI, we usually refer to uh, lumen area or lumen diameter. And these differences uh, clinically impact on the, you know, stent area and also the future uh, lumen area, I think. Uh, uh, eight months follow up, the clinical results and uh, uh, QCA results are similar. Yeah. So it's up to you, it means which, which one. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. So, you know, both in terms of clinical outcomes, if you use a uh, second generation drug editing stents, um, the, there, I think there are not a significant difference between IVAS guidance or OFDI guidance. So uh, you can use whichever you want, but, you know, according to, you know, as situation demands or region characteristics, I think we may be able to differentially use uh, both guidance if we can understand the difference and the similarities between the, these two modalities guidance. And finally, uh, in Kobe University, what percentage do you use IVAS and OCT? Actually, we prefer to use uh, OCT or OFDI guidance. Um, however, in you know cases like CTO or you know um, renal dysfunction patients, we prefer to use IVAS guidance. So we usually different to use it according to the situation or patients' uh, demands. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's uh, both are very, very good. Uh, both helps us uh, doing the PCI and uh, you can understand the mechanism that the IVAS can penetrate a deep area and OCD can find the surface in detail. So we use both together or uh, we can use uh, char characteristically, uh, but uh, do, do you, yeah, renal function is one of the big uh, determinant, determinants, but uh, uh, both are okay. What is that? What is that? Your choice? Uh, um, actually, when, you know, the patient has um, renal dysfunction, we prefer to use uh, IVUS guidance because if we use IVUS guidance, probably, you know, almost no contrast use can be, you know, available. So it's just very, very big advantage for the IVAS guided PCI for this sort of uh, patients. Okay, so thank you very much. Now it's a time, so we want thank to move you. to the next speaker. So uh, can I introduce the next speaker, Dr. Shiono uh, from uh, Wakayama Medical University. And he will talk about the uh, FFR, FFR, QFR. So, Dr. Shiono, please start the lecture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, just a moment, please. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone who is watching this webinar. I'm Shiono from Wakayama Medical University. Oh, doesn't move, okay. This is my COI. So today is my topic is about the physiological assessment in the cath labs. I think nowadays the, uh, the identifying the myocardial ischemia is prerequisite before performing any kinds of coronary revascularization. In that case, we can use FFR, IFR, and angiography-based FFR like QFR or FFR angio in the cath lab. So let's start with the FFR, which is short for fractional flow reserve. Fractional flow reserve is the coronary pressure derived uh, coronary physiological index that can be measured by using the pressure wire. If the wire down to the coronary artery or 
for which you want to assess the myocardial ischemia. And then you can get the simultaneously distal and proximal coronary artery. And then you need to in, induce the my, uh, maximum hyperemia by using the vasodilator like adenosine. The reason for that is the, the relationship between coronary pressure and the coronary flow becomes linear under the condition of the maximum hyperemia, which means that you can estimate the coronary flow from the coronary pressure, um, uh, not from the directly measuring the coronary flow. And then you can get the value, like in this case, 0.61, which indicates that uh, the coronary flow is impeded by the existence of the coronary stenosis to uh, 61%. So when it comes to the diagnostic performance of FFR, it is thought to be one of the most accurate index in terms of the coronary artery uh, disease. Uh, the accuracy is 93% in this study. And also robust clinical outcomes are available in FFR. These are the three pivotal randomized controlled trials regarding FFR-guided revascularization. First one is differ, the second one is the same, the last one is FAME too. As you can see here, so when the FFR is negative, you can safely defer the coronary revascularization. In the, in the FAME, uh, it is shown that uh, FFR-guided PCI is superior to angiography-guided PCI. PCI. The FAME2 study showed that when the FFR is positive, PCI reduces the coronary uh, cardiovascular events compared to the medical therapy alone. And what's uh, remarkable for this study is that, as you can see, they've got a very long outcome result. DEFAR has a 15 year, F FAME has a four, five years, FAME2 has a five years as well. So next one is IFR, which is short for instantaneous wave free ratio. So IFR is very similar to FFR. We still need to use the pressure wire, but we don't have to use adenosine. Instead, we can get the pressure ratio only during the uh, particular period of diastole, which is called the wave free, sorry, wave free period. So during the wave free period, the microvascular resistance in the coronary circulation becomes much lower than any pool, any part of the uh, any part of the car cardiac cycle, and then during that period, pressure and uh, the coronary flow becomes parallel, which means that we can estimate the coronary flow uh, during this period, like FFR. Uh, this is the diagnostic performance of IFR, when we compare the FFR and IFR using other types of uh, ischemic parameter like HS HSR, CFR, or SPECT or PET. So as you can see, the diagnostic performance between them is, is comparable. And also IFR has the robust clinical outcome data. Uh, one of the study is called Define FLIR, the other one is IFR Sweetheart. As you can see, IFR guided to the vascularization strategy is no inferior to the FFR guided strategy at least 12 months. I think now the two, up to two years data is available for both studies. So based on these clinical trials outcome, so now the FFR and IFR are both uh, recommended as class one indication in the international guideline and also both are recommended in the Japanese guideline as well. So the last one is the QFR short for quantitative flow ratio. This is also the invasive uh, physiological index, but this is different from IFR and FFR. It doesn't need a pressure wire. What we need is the clear angiography from two directions, uh, that are preferably more than 19 degrees separate from each other. And then we can get the 3D angio image. And also to, to take account of the current flow data, uh, it uses the semi-frame count. 
and then we can get the QFL value like this. In the validation study, QFL has the 93 accuracy of diagnostic performance as compared with FFO. There is another angio-based physiology, which is called FFR angio, very similar to QFR. This has the 93% accuracy as compared with FFR. But when it comes to clinical outcome, I have to say it remains to be seen. This is a different point from IFR and FFR. But I'd like to suggest one situation where QFR or FFR angio is very useful. You can see, see, here is the stenosis in the circumflex. If I want to know whether this lesion causes ischemia or not, I need to put the wire down through this very tortuous proximal region. So it could be possible, but I was reluctant to do that, but I did. But what I did was, firstly, I put the normal PCI wire down to the coronary artery and then exchange it with 300 centimeter pressure wire with the use of a microcaster. And then I got the value like this, it was a negative. But I would prefer if I had been able to get this result without putting the wire down to this tortuous artery. So in this case, I think the QFR and FFR angio has advantage. But other than that, since the, uh, uh, since the FFR and the IFR are recommended by the guidelines, if we can put the wire down to the artery safely, I think we need to go either of FFR and the IFR, but which way to go? If you are a person who prefer the, uh, uh, the clinical, robust clinical outcome, I think FFR is the one you should choose. But uh, if you, uh, you prefer not to give adenosine, which causes the symptoms to the patient, and also you know, which might uh, you know, make the procedure a little bit longer, I think the IFR is the one for you. I think it depends on your preference. But I think there's one situation which I can definitely recommend to use the resting index like IFR, that is tandem region. As you can see, here is the stenosis history and the middle part, there is the moderate stenosis and also there is a tight stenosis in the left domain. This is basically the three tandem regions. So at this point, what current guideline recommend us is to measure IFR and FFR, and we did. The IFR value was 0.47, which means that we need to treat this region, but how and where? That is what current guideline doesn't tell us. So in that situation, I think the IFR feedback tells, tells us a lot. So this is the study from our colleagues. So the, uh, showing that IFR pullback is very useful uh, in the tandem region. There is the tandem region in the area D, the IFR value at the distal was 0.71. And also pullback measurement showed that IFR gradient 0.08 distally and 0.16 proximally. So this, this curve showed that which treat, which lesions should be treated. And also we can get the predicted IFR, IFR value before putting, actually putting the stand. So as, as shown here, we can get 0.95 post IFR value if we treat these regions. What we need to do is a simple calculation, 0.71 plus 0.08 plus 0.16. And as shown here, uh, this prediction has been proven to be very accurate. And also in the IFR, and your correlation is available and also we have shown that this angio correlation is very accurate. So we did the angio correlation for this case. So this is the angio correlation with the IFR pullback. As you can see, if we treat all three lesions with three stents, 
we can get 1.00 after treating all these regions. But we could treat just two regions, distal and proximal, and we still get the uh, estimated IF value, IF value of 0.94. We showed the last, last uh, recommendation, and we just treated the distal and the proximal. This is the angiogram after treating these regions. We left the middle region. This is IFR prediction, 0.94. This is the actual value we got, 0.92. This is not exactly the same as predicted, but still okay. And this is above 0.89. So this is my summary and the conclusion. As everyone knows that FFR is the very matured index, which is has the uh, clinical outcome data and also recommended by the guideline. IFR is the same. But when it comes to QFR, it is shown that QFR is very accurate, but it doesn't clinical outcome data. So we still need to wait until we, we get the clinical outcome data in terms of the QFR. But when we want to go beyond current guideline, like the last case I showed, I think the IFR or other types of resting index has advantage. That is, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, very nice presentation about uh, FFR, IFR, QFR. And uh, finally, you showed the IFR pullback uh, suggests us a, a long lesion, how to treat it and the uh, accuracy of the uh, final results. And um, is it, uh, probably you have treated many cases using the IFR pullback and it, it is really accurate? Uh, yes, it's usually accurate, but sometimes, yeah, as you suggested, it's, uh, it's not accurate. But uh, I think it's due to uh, the reason uh, that Sometimes the PCI causes the hyperlemia. In that mm -hmm. case, if we measure the IFR after putting the stent, that value might not uh, might not exactly the same as indicated. In that mm -hmm. case, I think that some kind of hyperlemia induced, and then IFR differ from what we actually should have. So, but other than that, I think it's accurate. Theoretically, it's accurate, and the condition of the patient changes the value. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. I think so. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have some comments from the panel? So, Dr. Shono, can I just ask you for myocardial bridging, which of these uh, indices would you use? Uh, you mean the IFR and FFR? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to say. Uh, because I think there's no validation in terms of the myocardial bridge. I think the only thing, I, I think uh, there's one study which shows that uh, diastolic FFR is better than normal FFR. But uh, I don't think there's a study showing the, the you know, diagnostic performance of the IFR in myocardial bridge. So I, I had no idea, I'm sorry. Also for QFR, you know, there are many QFR softwares uh, around. Uh, can we assume that they are the same or they are actually quite different because different vendors, different companies have got their own QFR. Do we require every of this QFR to be validated against FFR before we uh, believe in it? Mm, I, yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think there is a meta-analysis which tested uh, various kinds of angio-based FFR uh, in 2018 in European Heart Journal, which showed that the accuracy of any kinds of angio-based FFR is very similar among them. So yeah, I think when it comes to angio-based FFR, QFR and FFR are both were well validated, but we can extrapolate uh, that other in other you know methods are comparable to QFR and FFR angio. 
Uh, you haven't mentioned about the CTFFR. Yeah. The CTFFR is equivalent to FFR and IFR. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's technically, I think by using the CTFFR technology, we can estimate the IFR, but I don't think it hasn't, it has been done. Um, Still no validation data. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there is. Do you have data regarding using FR, FFR guidance in, in the treatment of a coronary AV fistula? We, all, we always uh, say that's uh, some steering of the uh, coronary flow, but uh, can you quantify the, the, the severity or uh, guide the treatment? Uh, such as coil embolization or, or mm -hmm. occluded, yeah. Yeah, as far as I know, there is no, you know, sophisticated study that validates the value of FFR in case of coronary fistula. Yeah, what I know is just the case report. The fistula could affect the FFR value, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, what, that's, all what I, that's all I know. Questions from the audience. They yep. ask you, uh, so if you have a tendon lesion, yep. uh, do you stand the tightest lesion first uh, and then the check the FFR again mm -hmm. uh, after that? Okay, if I treat a tendon lesion by using the FFR, what I usually do is firstly, I get the FFR pulled back and then I treat the region which causes the largest FFR gradient and then check the FFR again. And if the FFR is less than 0.80 and there is a large pressure gradient in another region, I put another stent. That's what I do when I use the FFR. But uh, when I use the IFR, I just believe the IFR cog that I get in the first pullback because I can predict which lesion needs to be treated to get the, you know, uh, the, the IFR value I want. So we don't have to remeasure the IFR every single the stent we put. Hmm. Does that make sense? Um. Good, thanks. Uh, we, we can actually open the discussion up to all the other uh, speakers yeah. as well in this uh, session. So, uh, so uh, Michael, there are some questions from the audience again. Uh, between the rotor and the diamond back uh, orbital, uh, what sort of lesions and what sort of circumstances would you uh, not use uh, rotor but only use orbital? Oh, uh, yes. I, as I mentioned in my last uh, chart, when we have a very big vessel, uh, severely calcified, I don't think a rotor blader is going to be effective enough to ablate uh, much of the uh, calcium. Because the largest burr we have, uh, at least in Hong Kong, we have 2.0. So if you uh, uh, even use a very low speed, it won't be larger than 2.122. So when the vessel is like 3.5, 4.0, we usually uh, use orbital arthrectomy, try to effectively apply the superficial as well as the deep calcium before we con consider stenting. So that's the uh, occasion that uh, I would probably use an orbital arthrectomy instead of a, a rotational arthrectomy. Yes, I, I agree. So it's best for discrete uh, large vessel uh, calcified lesion with a concentric ring. Anything that's more than two millimeter rotor blader is not very useful. Yes. So is uh, orbital arthrectomy available in Japan and Taiwan? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's okay. Yeah. We don't have... It's available in Japan, but uh, I don't know about it's... Taiwan. No, no, we don't have. Yeah. Hmm. But Michael, I have a question for you. Yes, for, sure. In how many percent of case you need to use a road hard to pick the way then put the shockwave balloon or the orbital astrectomy device in. Right, um, we use uh, not that many because of the, mainly the cost issue. Uh, but um, 
for like very severe stenotic the big vessel. Sometimes uh, it's very difficult to track a uh, shortwave balloon down a very stenotic lesion. So we will probably start with a rotor ablation, give a track, and then use a shortwave balloon to actually make the crack uh, of a big vessel. That's, uh, I think, uh, the time that we will use a combination uh, therapy of uh, either rotor shock or the uh, orbital shock. One of the audience asked if you only have a fixed budget and you have to choose between rotor, orbital, and shockwave, which one would you recommend for your lab? Um, this is a sometimes a, a, a difficult question. Sometimes it's not easy to uh, tackle. But uh, I would say if you want um, easy setup, a shockwave balloon is very easy to set up. And it's very effective for small as well as big vessel, but it's not for very tight stenotic uh, uh, stenosis. For orbital arthrectomy, it's one device fits all. So you only need one uh, um, catheter. You can do a, a, a ablation of a small to a big vessel. So uh, a lot of ablations, uh, we uh, get used to this, a lot of data, a lot of experience. So uh, it's a bit difficult to answer, but it also depends on the uh, um, uh, population uh, uh, characteristics of uh, your patient, whether you have a small vessel, you have a big vessel, uh, before I can make uh, this uh, uh, decision. Actually, I will go for rotor ablation first, because I so, think it's still the most versatile of all the arthrectomy devices, because orbital and shockwave actually have uh, limitations of its own as well. So when you have a very tight blockage, you can't use orbital, you can't use shockwave balloon. And uh, so shockwave and balloon and orbital, uh, a lot of times are used for me, some niche applications where rotor cannot handle. So if you ask me uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, uh, because shockwave is the most expensive of all. So um, rotor is actually uh, the most effective if cost is a, uh, is a big consideration. But you uh, may end using two or three birds if you want to gradually upside the birds and mm. then that uh, it will add to the cost of the disease. Mm. Yeah. Ikari, there's a question in Japanese. Can you help to uh, translate? Ah, the last question is a, it's a technical question, so we can ignore. Okay, okay. Yeah, sound, sound is difficult to listen to. <laughs> Yeah. So what, a, one of the things about shockwave balloon is that uh, right now the current iteration is still not very ideal. Uh, we have about 10% of cases where the balloon will rupture during the process because as you fracture the calcium, sometimes the calcium, uh, you know, the spikes can come in and poke through the balloon. So 10% so of the time uh, before using up the entire pulses that you have for shockwave, you find that your balloon is already ruptured. And every time you take out a shockwave balloon is three thousand four dollars so that's very expensive so so that's a, a limitation of a shockwave at this point in time but i understand that they are trying to make the newer uh, version of shockwave with a thicker balloon uh, uh, so we'll have to see but right now i feel that is the uh, one of the limitations of shockwave little trips so can i ask a question to dr lee yes sure uh, from the imaging perspective, I think uh, rotor ablation has a big advantage because, you know, if we, we do um, OCT or OFDI imaging before rotor ablation, we can, you know, predict uh, which uh, area of calcification can be ablated based upon the pathway of OCT or OFDI caster. However, you know, can you predict the Position or size of calcification uh, if you use orbital arthrectomy or shockwave? Um, it's, uh, for, for orbital arthrectomy, as I show you, it's a bit difficult to predict because it tends to mm. play more of along the guide wire. So when okay. there's a guide wire bias, it tends to play more mm. along the guide wire. For shortwave, I think uh, we use it mostly for concentric calcium. Okay. So when you crack, you usually crack in different directions. Although mm. I don't think it's predictable which direction you will go, 
but it will go in almost all directions. So you will end up in a very effective cracking, fracturing of the calcium. I think that's a very effective way to enable a full span, stand expansion and acquisition at the end of the piece. I see. So if there is a, you know, fibrous plug or lipidic plug there, shockwave didn't affect such lesions, right? Uh, yes, if it is soft plug. Only calcification. Yes, for shockwave okay, I see. for calcification. Thank you. So that's why shockwave is relatively safe. Right. Mm. Okay. Otaki, can, can I ask you, Dr. Otaki, on this uh, OCT versus IVERS? Yeah. I know in your opinions trial, it's quite similar in findings to the Illumium 3, where there's actually quite diff little difference in terms of the uh, final antigraphic uh, 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 scant uh, area uh, following IVERS versus OCT. Uh, but one of the disadvantages course for OCT is, uh, is the use of contrast. And perhaps it might take even longer time than IVERS. So uh, I'd like to ask you one question with regard to uh, the blood clearance. Uh, do you use other agents besides uh, contrast for blood clearance in OCT? Because now we are going into yellow funding, which is one of the colloid solutions in order to reduce the contrast use in patients with renal failure. So what is your experience with regard to a blood clearance reagent in your practice? So for most of the case, we use uh, contrast media, I mean, 100%. And especially for the first uh, initial imaging and uh, immediately before stenting. However, in between them, like, like after balloon dilatation, we sometimes use uh, low molecular dextrone, uh, which may which is not, you know, um, which may be uh, effective for, you know, uh, avoiding the renal, inducing renal dysfunction. So if you use low molecular dextrone, uh, we can get relatively uh, clear uh, imaging in the standard segment, uh, I mean, scanned segment. So for left mean intervention, do you use IVERS or OCT? Yeah, if you, you know, the patient with renal dysfunction, we prefer to use IVUS rather than OCT. Uh, no, so if uh, no renal dysfunction for oh, left no renal dysfunction. For left yeah, main we usually, PCI. oh, left main. Um, usually we perform uh, OCT guidance if the lesion is located in the body of left main. But if the lesion is, uh, you know, expanded to the very ostium of left main, so, uh, we prefer to use IVUS because uh, stent positioning uh, is very important issue for such lesions. Hmm. To, to avoid undersizing of the stent, actually we now follow the Illumion criteria. Hmm. We use the EGL measurement instead of the lumen measurement when we do that will actually ensure a bigger stand or a bigger, uh, a more optimal sizing of the uh, either the balloon or the stand. So, are you using right. a loop measurement or a EGL measurement? Oh, uh, usually we use uh, opinion uh, like strategy based upon you know referring to the lumen area, distal lumen area. But uh, I know that the Illumian trial also had a uh, you know better outcome. But if we try to follow the Illuminant um, strategy, stent size can be larger than opinion-based stent sizing. But, you know, sometimes we can get the dissection at the stent edges. So to avoid that, we prefer to use the OCT uh, opinion like, uh, yeah, criteria. Dr. Shiono. Can I ask that when you encounter left main, distal left main, and then bifurcation lesions with osteo LED, also circumflex? Yeah. How do you decide whether that left main stenosis needs to be tackled or not? Because sometimes for me, it's a bit difficult when you have that bifurcation lesions, especially when there's other lesions, tendon lesions in the distal part of the LED or circumflex as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. If I 
if I assess the region by using the FFR, yes. I put the wire down to the LED and also circumflex. And we want to check whether ischemia is present in the LED region and also circumflex region. Um, and so if both are positive, I might consider sending the patient to surgery. Okay. And if we want to make sure that the left main region is truly focal or not, I think IFR has advantage over FFR. As you mentioned, FFR value is affected by the distal region in case of tandem stenosis. And also the FFR value in LAD is affected by the region in circumflex to some extent. So, but in, when it comes to IFR, we can, you know, uh, decide which region is relevant to this ischemia. I mean, so we can narrow down which region truly needs to be treated. So, yeah, if you consider the PCI, I think IFR uh, is the better because we can you know, spot to the, uh, the, to the needy to, uh, needs to be treated. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so now uh, it is a time and we need to close this session. And uh, I, I want to summarize this session. But today, four speakers uh, makes a great talk and uh, we can uh, summarize and uh, our uh, brain brush up so it's a good, good talk. And I want to tell uh, international friends about uh, this, this year is a uh, atherectomy year in Japan. Th that's why, because uh, uh, rotational atherectomy, we have used more than 20 years since 1997, but the uh, institution, institute is limited to surgical backup. On-site surgical backup is required. But this year, off-site surgical backup is okay. So lots of hospital can use rotational, orbital, or laser atherectomy this year. So it's under COVID-9 pandemic, so it's um, it's crowded. But uh, this year, it's we are really happy <laughs> this year. And this uh, your talk is very uh, suggestive and very nice, impressive. So thank you very much for joining. JCS and APSC uh, session. So I want to close this session. Thank you very much.